greetings to uh, yeah, the far, far east. Let me first thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, let me thank yeah, the chairperson for this uh, kind intro. I have to admit, I didn't know CNUTS and I'm absolutely impressed what you have been doing there in terms of CNETS 2 is doing such a comprehensive analysis of the uh, growth and development and micronutrient status of so many children. Chapeau, that is absolutely impressive. So can I have my slides, please? It's my privilege today to introduce metabolomics as a toolbox for nutrition and food science. And uh, I have been uh, in the area of metabolomics for quite some time. I decided to choose two areas to show you the principles and the, let's say, potential of metabolomics. But I also show you where the current limits are. So let's start. There was a paper published in Current Opinion of Biotechnology in 2016 saying that metabolomics could be a new fantastic toolbox that allows to assess the production of food material in terms of the raw materials and, and uh, the food crops, but it also could be applied to industrial food processing and in the end to human nutrition in terms of assessing food intake on one side, but also assessing uh, the context of food, diet, and health. So in this respect, I shall be focusing only on this part today, but you should know that the technology can be taken in essence into every single step along the production of food and the consumption of food by the uh, consumers. Okay, let's start with some very principal things. I mean, you all know that we are uh, we have a genome and we are almost identical to 99.8%, but each of us is exposed to a variety of environmental factors that taken together are called the exposome. And uh, what has been added in, in recent years is that we are not alone. You can talk of yourself in the plural because you host literally hundreds or even thousands of different bacterial species, the largest quantity of them in the human intestine. And, uh, and we call the genome and the microbiome means all those bacteria together a meta genome. So that's the state of science, and we have a fantastic array of technologies now to look into this interplay of the human genome, but also of the human microbiome, means the meta genome with the exposome. And, uh, and that means we can do the genetic profiling of each individual. We can assess at the level of the uh, mRNA, the so-called transcriptome, with literally thousands of transcripts at a time. We can uh, apply uh, high-end proteomics technologies to get a picture of the, let's say, 100,000 different proteins encoded by around 22,000 genes found in the human genome. And here comes in the metabolome, which is the sum of all small molecules in a biological system. And the biological system could be an individual cell or could be a human where you, will, of course, have only access to a number of biosamples, which means blood and urine and maybe tears, fluid, etc. So the uh, metabolome world covers the small molecules. And I'm sure that most of you have uh, seen that before, the famous biochemical pathways. Uh, you could find them all over the world in each university institute and it shows you all the small molecules that make up human metabolism. And we see in the center part, the citric acid cycle and all the different reactions that either lead to the citric acid cycle yeah, or connect to cholesterol metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the world of the metabolites that are the things we want to measure. And, uh, and here are the different technologies that can be applied uh, without going into details, each technology has certain advantages. 
but also certain disadvantages. So we have uh, gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry here. We have liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry here. We have nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And, uh, and that means we generate uh, thousands of signals here that in the end need sophisticated technology for, for interpretation of what you have been measuring. So depending on the equipment you have available, and, uh, and that means the different machines that you need, you have also some limits to what you can measure in terms of the profile of the metabolites, the number of the metabolites and the sensitivity of analysis. So there are three major application areas in the world of the metabolites uh, called metabolomics. One is the identifications of markers of exposure, and I will give you examples later on, which means yeah, these technology can be applied to assess the environmental impact. And that means also the, the effect of foods consumed by an individual. The second is more health related. It's biomarker discovery with some st uh, statistics coupled and that can be done for targeted, where you know which metabolites you analyze, but also non-targeted uh, analysis, which means you, you just uh, obtain signatures without knowing exactly what individual metabolites yeah, make up within this signature. And then you have very basic yeah, fundamental methods that uh, address the question of uh, yeah, how from the gene to the transcripts to the metabolites, yeah, you can uh, figure out new pathways. And that means, yeah, combined with all kinds of high-end uh, metabolome databases, you can generate new knowledge regarding metabolism, diet, and health relationship. So let's talk about food constituents and, and human metabolism. Of course, the uh, yeah, food components are energy substrates. They are then in the body building blocks or macromolecules. So everything that makes up the human body. You know, some of the food constituents are precursors for very specific synthetic pathways in human metabolism. Some are neurotransmitters or mediators yeah, in the uh, human system. Many of the food constituents uh, trigger uh, by binding to specific receptors, metabolic responses, and they also can serve as allosteric regulators. Some of the uh, constituents are metabolic end products, others are xenobiotics, and I would call all the secondary plant components as xenobiotics, because uh, they are strange molecules, and uh, I will come back to that later on. And then, of course, you have uh, dietary fibers, for example, which are non-digestible components, at least for the enzymes that the human produces, although the bacteria in your large intestine can, of course, degrade the, uh, those fibers and, and produce short-chain fatty acids. So if we look into the uh, world of the metabolites and, and look at those that are diet-derived, and you can measure those in, uh, in the human plasma after consumption of certain food items, then you are confronted with a problem that many of those uh, metabolites are also produced endogenously, which means you don't know exactly whether it comes from diet or whether it's produced in the human body. And that makes uh, some of the interpretations of the findings pretty complicated. What also makes it more complicated is that you have a number of these microbiome or microbiota derived metabolites that appear in blood and later also in plasma. And, and some of those bacteria have really very specific metabolic pathways producing really strange molecules. And, and we're just now learning what is produced by the microbiome and, and later pops up in blood or, or urine. So there are some problems uh, that relate to the interpretation of the findings. Now let's go through some of the food constituents and their character. So we talk about the human system here. We have, uh, we have plasma as the uh, access point for measuring the metabolites. We also have the urine here that allows us to measure what has been consumed. 
You have the microbiome. You also can analyze fecal samples, of course. And, uh, and you have uh, then the lung and the breath here. And uh, if we now go into the macronutrients, for example, the starch or glucose, amino acids and the dietary proteins, or the fatty acids, uh, such as the triglycerides or phospholipids, most of them can be stored, and then you get obese if you store too much, and the rest is oxidized. And when they are oxidized, you just produce carbon dioxide and water. So that means uh, the consumption of starch as starch cannot be measured in the human system. Of course, you can monitor the uh, response in the plasma glucose, for example, but in the end, yeah, it's hard to say what really has been consumed if we talk about sugars and, and starches. It's a little bit different with the amino acids because amino acids uh, and all the proteins contain nitrogen. And of course, this nitrogen can be found in urine later on uh, in form of urea or of ammonia. And since you also have sulfur containing amino acids in the proteins, you also find then the sulfur in terms of H2S or, or sulfuric acid here. So yeah, the macro, uh, amongst the macronutrients, uh, yeah, the proteins are easy to quantify based on the nitrogen that finally is excreted uh, as the surplus of the uh, oxidized uh, amino acids. If you move on and uh, talk about cholesterol, for example, as part of the uh, animal-based uh, food products, and uh, that holds also true for some of the uh, secondary plant components, these are strange molecules. Humans are not able to degrade the structure of cholesterol and the related bile acid compounds, although bacteria can partly modulate these cholesterol um, uh, derived compounds, and then you find uh, yeah, the bile acids or nutrasterols um, predominantly in feces, although there's a little bit in, in urine of those compounds as well. Uh, if we talk about other constituents of the diet, in particular the essential micronutrients such as vitamins, minerals, and trace elements, yeah, there is currently no really good metabolomics approach that helps you to assess that. And I will come back to this later on. Yeah, you, of course, yeah, find some of the uh, degradation products of the vitamins, but you also see uh, yeah, some appearing in, in the feces. But for minerals and trace elements, uh, you need completely different technology, and they are usually not included in any, the assessment of these uh, compounds is normally not included in any of the metabolomics applications I'm aware of. Now let's move on to the green world, which means the world of the plant products. This uh, green world is enormous complex. Uh, you have about 10,000 different compounds that you can identify in, in plant food, and most of them are polyphenols or polyphenolic acids. And, and those compounds, again, cannot be metabolized by the human itself but they undergo degradation by the microbiome, as you will see in a minute. And it's for some of the compounds, it has been shown that they can be completely degraded by the microbiome and you just find carbon dioxide in, in breath. But there are many, many conjugates and degradation products that finally appear in urine. But of course, they also yeah, can be found in plasma. So each category of nutrients in your diet has, of course, a different fate. And that makes it clear that you cannot get every information you're looking for when you do metabolomics. So let's talk about the exposure markers, means methods that can be applied to better assess what people really have been consuming. You're all aware that it is pretty difficult to determine really what people are consuming because you ask uh, food by food frequency questionnaires or 24 hour recalls. But we all know there's some underreporting or misreporting in there. So there is a hope now that metabolomics can improve this assessment of uh, dietary intake. And I show you just a very few examples, uh, some nice examples, but also some of the limits. That was a very nice study that demonstrated that proline betaine, which is contained in these uh, 
you know, citrus fruits is a, what I call a flow through compound. It is absorbed in the intestine and it is completely degraded in urine. And even the amount consumed can be quantified by quantifying prolin beta in, in urine. And that has been tested in a number of uh, epidemiological studies. And it has been shown that it is a robust marker for citrus intake. Although you need to know the concentration of proline beta in, in the citrus fruit to be able to quantify the consumption of citrus. And, and here you see in this little table that uh, orange and grapefruit and a little bit of lemon juices are the prime sources of proline beta in. So whenever you find proline beta in in a urine sample, you can almost be sure that the person has been consuming not too long ago yeah, such citrus uh, yeah, fruits or their juices. Next example are markers for meat intake. And I show you some of the studies we did. We used meat and, and in particular chicken and profiled in human volunteers receiving the chicken press in two different sizes. One was 100 gram and the other was 200 grams in the same volunteers. And we profiled about 100 uh, or 180 different metabolites and identified uh, in particular the uh, yeah, methyl histidines here as a supermarker. And of course, anserine as a more specific dipeptide that is just found in chicken and not in any of the other meat sources you can have. And based on that, you can uh, determine a profile of metabolites that is pretty specific for consumption of chicken. And what we were able to do was in the end, based on an array of metabolites, we even could quantify how much chicken meat the volunteers had consumed. And that means whenever you do dose escalation studies and you take a certain pattern of metabolites that are specific for a particular food component, you may even be able to quantify the amount of a food consumed. But these are very few examples that you can find in literature that allow quantifi quantification. I come to one of the compounds that makes uh, a lot of uh, public interest, and that is the trimethylamine oxide. TMA oak is produced in the intestine from all those uh, different animal products here, which uh, come with phosphatidylcholine, choline, betaine, carnitine. They all undergo degradation in the microbiome. And the trimethylamine is then taken up into the human system and is oxidized in liver. It pops up in plasma and it appears in urine. And what you see is that in particular fish yeah, also brings in a large quantity of TMAO, which makes it pretty complicated because TMAO had been identified as a compound that is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. And that is shown here, as higher the TMAO levels in blood, as higher is the risk for myocardial infarction. And here comes a complicated issue. If you eat and uh, consume a large quantity of fish, which are considered to be beneficial when we talk about the omega-3 fatty acids, you at the same time provide a lot of TMAO to the volunteers, and that TMAO was considered to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. And, and the story is not at its end yet. It looks like the TMAO is more a marker of impaired kidney function than a real risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. But nevertheless, TMAO has been produced uh, in hundreds of papers yeah, by metabolomics as pro approaches as a very dangerous molecule. Let's move on. I just mentioned the omega-3 fatty acids and I'll show you a study I was uh, participating in where we got blood samples from 1,600 volunteers from all across Europe. And, and we never saw the volunteers and we received just dry blood spots from the fingertip here that the volunteers collected back home. 
And they send in the blood samples, the dry blood samples for analysis. And we analyze the fatty acid pattern in those uh, dry blood samples. And, and we also looked into genetic variability in one of the enzymes of uh, the polyene fatty acid metabolism, and that is fatty acid desaturase here. Uh, that connects then the ETA to EPA and the DGLA to our hedonic acid pathways here. So what we observed then yeah, was that indeed we can identify in those human volunteers, yeah, based on genetic profiling, certain uh, genetic variants in the fatty acid desaturase enzyme. And when we analyze the blood samples then, we see that this genetic heterogeneity indeed is visible in the pattern of the fatty acids in these dry blood spots. That tells you that uh, that is a very fantastic method where you can uh, apply that even without seeing your volunteers that you want to study. Uh, we could assign certain food items to that, and that was uh, part of the Food for Me study. And, uh, and finally, yeah, that uh, yeah, demonstrates uh, that you can also use the excretion of these polyphenols. And that was done here for 35 selected plasma polyphenols to associate consumption of polyphenols with particular disease uh, endpoints. And that is in the European uh, prospective study on colon cancer where you see that the intake of uh, plasma polyphenols measured in the urine of these uh, participants of 500,000 Europeans associates with colon cancer incidence. But that little uh, slide here shows you that uh, that all depends very much on your particular fingerprint of microbiome, because yeah, not everybody produces the same metabolites. So my take home message is the uh, first part, metabolomics is powerful. Currently we're not able to quantify the uh, yeah, foods consumed, but since metabolomics is around for only a, a few years now, yeah, it is uh, on its way. Yeah, I'm, I'm still optimistic that one day we can get much better information if we apply metabolomics and uh, quantify yeah, than the food consumed based on urine or plasma analysis. A, a few minutes on biomarker of the health disease trajectory uh, where metabolomics has also been applied. Uh, I mean, you're all aware of the obesity problem and obesity driving uh, insulin resistance and driving the developments of type two diabetes mellitus with this relation between BMI here and, two, uh, and disease risk for diabetes type two. Yeah, there were a number of studies uh, yeah, in recent years uh, demonstrating distinct signatures of plasma metabolites in fasting state as being associated with a trajectory from healthy over obese insulin resistant to diabetes. And you see here an amino acid profile to predict diabetes. And, and interestingly, there were mainly the branch chain amino acids and uh, some of the aromatic acid amino acids that were found in uh, thousands of individuals as associated with type 2 diabetes risk and development. And they proposed that they could uh, predict type 2 diabetes 12 years before it was really established in the uh, volunteers. Many, many other studies have been uh, you know, conducted uh, both in, in urine analysis and plasma analysis, you know, in obesity and insulin resistant states, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there are now a long, long list of metabolites yeah, that can be identified as being associated with BMI, as being associated with insulin resistance, as being associated with uh, type 2 diabetes. And when we uh, classify those, uh, yeah, it's uh, surprising that you have predominantly amino acids and amino acid derivatives in plasma as the best biomarkers yeah, for type 2 diabetes development. And on top, you have uh, numerous of the uh, phospholipids and lysophospholipidylcholines and some of the single myelines, as well as acyl carnitines that yeah, give you a, a signature of insulin resistance and type 2 yeah, uh, risk. 
And that also has a certain genetic background as this one paper here by Claudia Langberg shows you. Yeah, some of the people have uh, yeah, genetic variants in, in an enzyme that regulates branch chain amino acid metabolism and adds a particular individual risk yeah, to the uh, type two development. Yet the methods applied in metabolomics to demonstrate that it is a good toolkit for biomarker discovery in, uh, in diabetes risk in the end failed. And that is shown by these rock curves here. So currently, despite the fact that we have literally hundreds of papers that use metabolomics to describe the trajectory from healthy to deceased, in total, they are not really yet improving diagnostics. So, yeah, take home message part two. Metabolab markers of obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes mellitus, as observed in the human samples, are mainly products of impaired amino acid metabolism. And I emphasize, yeah, particularly the branch chain amino acids, so leucine and, and isoleucine and valine, but also glycine, threonine, and lysine. And then comes the whole array of lipids that uh, are measured also in all the standard metabolite uh, profiling platforms, such as of metabolome or, sorry, or uh, yeah, Biocrates or some of the other commercial entities. Now, the key determinant for those changes that you see in plasma in people with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes can all be related to insulin sensitivity. And the, uh, yeah, let's say the anti yeah, action of glucagon to insulin. So it is all biologically feasible what you measure there. But if you measure the normal glucose response to an oral, uh, oral glucose tolerance test of fasting glucose and you do a family anamnesis, you still are better in predicting type 2 diabetes than using high-end metabolomics method. So that's the bad part of uh, yeah, the current state of, of art. And, uh, and if it comes to things that are more relevant for the nutritional status, and you are interested, of course, in micronutrient deficiency in status and iron and, and so on, most of those commercially available metabolomics platforms yeah, do not cover those relevant indicators. Uh, some of them have, by chance, yeah, some of the vitamins, yeah, but none of them has all the vitamins, none of them has any trace elements or any minerals. So yeah, these methods of metabolite profiling can currently not really provide any essentials for determining the nutritional status. And that is the bad part of the whole thing. So I'm, I'm giving advice to some of the companies and I always force them to include uh, these uh, measures of nutrient status and supply status. Uh, that is not easy to do as we all know. Yeah, but uh, without that, metabolomics has only a limited applicability in the nutrition and food science world. I gave you examples, but in terms of what you're interested in, it's currently pretty limited. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I'm still enthusiastic that metabolomics will in the end uh, proceed and, and push the whole area of nutrition and food science forward. Yeah, the last 10 years have been uh, rewarding, have been exciting. Although, as I uh, yeah, explained to you, there are fantastic things you can do, but there are also clear-cut limits to the application of metabolomics in nutrition and food science. So thank you very much, and I hope we have a vital discussion.